I'm a very, very big fan of our oceans. Uh, you can't tell. Uh, I've been working too hard lately, so I lost my tan. But I do love diving, and I, I love fishing. I love the very fact that we can go out to sea and catch fish and bring home and cook it and have a family meal. That to me is uh, the, uh, the ide nirvana. That's where all of us want to be. And that's why we all work so hard to try and achieve that in our lives. Um, and the other thing I've also noticed is when I go to the supermarkets, when I go and shop for fish, I realize that we have a problem. But it's not one of those problems where it glares you in the face. It's one of those very subtle problems that people try to keep at the back of their minds, but it's not coming out mainstream. And that is why I thought it might be a good idea to try and share with you this story about our oceans. Singaporeans, human beings around the world, we love seafood. We just love seafood. And if you look at East Coast, if you go to East Coast over the weekend, you'll find the car park full of cars all queuing to eat chili crabs and our famous uh, sotong, uh, cuttlefish and squid. And it's just part of our DNA. So when we look at seafood, what comes to mind? Is it fresh? Is it swimming? Are the eyes red? Are the gills red? I mean, that's kind of the, the Singapore psyche, right? The second thing we ask always is, how much is it, right? Market price, we see that a lot these days. What does that mean? Can I order it? Can I afford it? I think there's a third dimension or the third criteria that we should think about. How was that fish or seafood harvested? Where was it harvested? Does it matter? It's swimming. It's fresh. It's the right price. But do you know what did that seafood consume during its grow-out period? Do you know what fed it or who fed it? Was it young children? Was it slaves? So these are questions that we should ask as human beings because apart from enjoying a meal with friends and relatives and colleagues, I think there's a whole supply chain behind that piece of fish that we choose to ignore for reasons, I guess, uh, we, have, we live in very high-pressure societies and we have to work and there's no time to think about such things. But there were real people behind catching that fish and putting that fish on your plate. And I'd like to share with you a little bit about how that works today. Does this look familiar to some of you? Okay, if you do go there, please wear shoes that you can afford to throw away because it is smelly. I mean, really, it is where the bulk of our seafood comes from. This is Jurong Fishery Port. And you won't believe this, in modern metropolis Singapore, this is taken recently. This is what our Jurong Fishery Port looks like today. It's fine, actually. It's actually quite quaint. It's very nostalgic, if you ask me. But if you actually dwell deeper and you went in and looked at the stores and you saw the seafood that was being brought in, you should be concerned because the variety of seafood that's being traded by the stores is very limited. And if you had a flashback, if you went back into the 1960s, you will find lots of different species, different beautiful colors. It's just so vibrant. Today, the bulk of it is just limited to a number of species traded in very, very high volume, just going through that fishery port. If you speak to the fishmongers, and I like to do that, you know, speak to them, and they can feel it. You can see it from their eyes. They have no family that want to take over this business, one, two. They also see a very limited future because supplies are limited. Fishes are coming in smaller. They want to do something about this because this is their livelihoods, but I'm just a fishmonger. What can I do? 
You know, I've been doing this for 20, 30, some 40 years. What can I do? I'm just a fishmonger. So let me share with you some interesting facts. So this is produced by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. I'll use FAO for short, moving forward. Wild capture fisheries is the blue line behind me. That has remained flat, pretty much flat, if you look at the screen, since the 1990s. We catch approximately 90 metric tons, 90 million metric tons of wild capture fisheries over the years, up to 2015, Despite the fact that now we've got cloud-based mobile technology, we have satellite technology, we are going further afield, we are even fishing in the Antarctic, in the Arctic today, we're going deeper, we catch fish, we can get fish in Singapore, if you didn't know, right 4,000, 5,000 meters below sea level. So the technology is there, but despite the fact that we fish so hard, we go out and catch that, catch that fish, Mother Earth can only provide 90 million tons. So what do we do? Instinctively, the next step is to farm. So we farm. Boy, did we farm. So from the 1990s, you can see an exponential growth in aquaculture. If you were an angel investor, put your money in farming, fish farming, because that is almost a guaranteed thing, because we love seafood. If supply is limited, the oceans cannot provide, there will be demand. So aquaculture took off. Aquaculture is one of the best solutions today to provide seafood proteins for all of us. However, there is a constraint, that is feed. Farmers can only grow their fish on land or in cages at sea, provided they have access to feed. Feed is limited. Some feed comes from land, but the bulk of the feed comes from the ocean. And once we breach that that those limits on feed, you'll find the aquaculture line tapering down. Another very interesting fact is that as of 2014, our diets have changed. You can see this chart. The orange line is basically the consumption of aquaculture, of farm seafood. The blue line is the consumption of wild. So really, the consumption of wild seafood has not changed much over the years. But if you look at the consumption of farm seafood, that has grown. What is also interesting is for the first time in 2014, we eat as much wild seafood as farm seafood. That's, in, that's significant. If you go to the supermarket today in Singapore, or in Australia, anywhere around the world, you'll find that you get more farm seafood on the wet fish counters than you did in the past. So variety of seafood has fallen significantly. And what it has also provided, I believe, again, is a false sense of security. So if you ask my mum, and I did, uh, when, I, when I started this, 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 this role, and asked, you know, is there a problem with our ocean system? There's no problem, Kelvin. There's seafood everywhere. You go to the supermarket, there's fish, there's prawns, there's crabs, you go to the restaurants, there's no problem. Is there a problem? There is no problem. There's lots of seafood. So aquaculture has actually provided us that safety net, given us the perception that there is seafood. But if you have to go deeper than this, some examples of seafood, farm seafood, sushi, might not be familiar to you, that's Pangasius or Dory. Dory? Nice name, Dory. Dory was created to provide the market with a beautiful name for a fish called Pangasius. If you try to sell Pangasius, it's going to be a marketing nightmare. Dory, on the other hand, beautiful. Especially if you put it in a beautiful packaging. That's fun. Tilapia. Tilapia is one of the most resilient fishes out there, and actually, it's one of my favorite. It's actually a very good fish, and the feed-to-cost ratio is very, very good. It's optimal for farming. Vename, predominantly farmed in Thailand and Vietnam and Indonesia. And sometimes you get barramundi, for those of you who might, might be more familiar with sea bass, Asian sea bass. 
really, these are the, these, these are the species you'll be eating, and you'll be eating a lot more. Trust me on this. For the next generation, they probably only eat this. Why is there no variety of seafood? Because it's very expensive today to farm some of the species that's available in the wild. We've not cracked that code yet. So it's all about optimizing costs in farming. And they found a few species today, they can really scale up. And these are the ones that's available in Singapore and pretty much in Southeast Asia. According to OECD, by 2030, the middle class population will grow to about 5 billion, 4.9 to be exact. Out of this 5 billion, 40% will be Asians. This group of middle class population people will need 150 million tons of wild seafood. 70% of that will be consumed here in Asia. We are the world's biggest and largest consumer of seafood, period. An average Singaporean will consume between four to five times higher than an average German. An average German only consumes four species. An average Sing Singaporean will do as much as 20 species. We love seafood, we eat a lot of it, but we eat a lot of variety. So just from the sheer population of the middle class growth, that will exert a lot of pressure on seafood, supply, but more importantly, prices. We can expect seafood prices to increase, and I was in Chinatown last week. The cost of fish maw, which is the stomach lining of fish, has gone up by 25 to 30 percent year on year. That's significant. The reason is because people are stocking, they're buying, they're keeping, so that's creating a lot of problems with supply. So do we have a problem? Do we really have a problem or is this really just, you know, an interesting fact? It's not going to impact me. I'll go back and eat my seafood. By 2050, which is not very far away, we're 2015, wild capture fisheries will collapse. And when I say collapse, this is irreversible. So you have to go to the aquariums to see a lot of the seafood that we consume today, not for those exotic species. This scientific data is published in all the respected journals around the world, but we choose to ignore it. Life goes on. What's the reason for this collapse? I mean, this is not very far, 35 years. So why is it that it's collapsing? Two reasons, overfishing. Despite governments setting quotas, limiting the amount of fish we can catch from the oceans, we are building more boats. We just love to build our boats, bigger boats. Despite controls on licenses and quotas, the sea is just too big an area for us to monitor and prevent overfishing. So if you rely on governments, on fishermen, on marine and patrol boats to try and control overfishing, I personally believe it's not going to work. It's just too big an area. It's three quarters of the earth is oceans. Look at Singapore. We tried to ban fishing in many of our waterways. There's still a lot of fishing going on. It's just very hard. Can you imagine you're in Indonesia or Philippines where there's so many islands? So that's the problem. The first problem is overfishing. The second problem is IUU, which is, stands for Illegal, Unregulated, Unreported Fishing. What that is, is in, in essence, is going out, fishing, depriving the local villages of their livelihoods, and then selling it to places around the world without tax. Tax-free. Tax-free fishing. That causes a lot of problem because it's unregulated. We cannot control the fishing quotas. And for the legal guys who fish sustainably, who fish paying, paying taxes, they can't compete. How can you compete with someone who doesn't pay taxes? So these are the two main reasons. Singapore is very vulnerable. We, we import the bulk of all our seafood. We tried to farm, and we're still trying very hard, but we're up against a lot of natural 
variables that we can't control, but we should continue to strengthen our supply chain. Can you imagine Singapore without this? Chili crab with just chili. The Singapore Tourism Promotion Board won't like this very much. Can you imagine fried noodles or fried kuei tia or rice noodles without cockles? That cockles is the one that gives you that umami, that, that sandy feel in your mouth. It will not be the same. It will be disastrous. So let me share with you a secret. There is a solution. A market-based pool, no longer a supply-driven economy for seafood, where the market decides what goes on our plates. As consumers, we have the power. You and me, we have the power to change things, to disrupt supply chains. Here's one example of a theory of change. By choosing sustainable seafood, we can incentivize fishermen to fish sustainably, stop using dynamite, to fish within their means and not to catch too much. That will then create more seafood or more sustainable seafood for future generations. When we shop, we need to ask the questions about where the seafood is coming from. Only then can you know if that fish or that piece of prawn or lobster or crab is from a sustainable source, apart from the fact that it is fresh and it's at the right price. We do have examples in this part of the world. This is one example, which is the India Ashtamundi Estuary Short Neck Clam Fishery. This fishery got certified by the Marine Stewardship Council and is the first in India to be sustainable. This fishery is the second largest in Kerala. It supports over 3,000 villages and it was in the brink of collapse in the mid-1990s. Today, it's a thriving fish, fishing community, and it's also an example for other fishing communities in Kerala to try and follow their lead. So what's the story of their success? Is that consumers like ourselves, we should support fisheries like this India Ashtamundi clam fishery. We are all consumers. If we support them, we make them successful, other fishermen will follow their lead. If they fail, the implications is not on this generation, all of us in this room, it's on our children. And I have an eight-year-old son, and really I don't want him, when he comes to our age, to try and you know, pin this on us, that we did not do anything to prevent this from happening in our generation. So I'd like to say that every bit counts. It's like the story of the boy who threw a sea star or starfish back into the ocean, despite the fact that the, the tide keeps bringing the sea star back to the shore, the little boy said that at least I saved that sea star. As individuals, we all have the power. Let's make today's choices for a sustainable tomorrow. Thank you.